Start talking. Okay, this is an interview with Abraham Spivak, and he's a longtime Subu member, helper, and various other jobs in Subu over the years. And Abraham, what I want to do is start with if you could tell the story of how you found and came into Subu. Um, you know, Rahman, I wrote that story for oh, that chap in Canada um, who put out the publication like finding the miraculous or discovering the miraculous, you know, in answer to Uspensky's In Search of the Miraculous. You know, Uspensky was one of the chief disciples of, of Gurdjieff. So, I can't think of the Canadian's name who did that publication. Maybe, oh, Lister Sutherland, I think, was his name. Do, does that ring a bell? Uh, Lester Sutherland. Right, yeah. Canadian? Yeah. He, he did that, so I wrote, I told him that I had grown up with a friend since we were 10 years old, that would be 1939, we were the most profound of friends. Um, it was uh, both a, an admiration and a realization that the other was a, uh, going to be a tough competitor. It was like that kind of a relationship where we both admired but realized uh, it was going to be tough to top the other guy. Yeah. Um, uh, and through uh, no intention of mine, uh, I loved classical music, Rock, Rachman, and I heard um, Ralph Vaughan Williams Fantasia on a theme of Thomas Tallis. And it so moved me uh, when I saw my friend, I had to tell him about that piece of music. I always kept him informed about classical music. He was always eager to learn. And I told him about this piece that I heard, which was extremely moving and uh, to me, very spiritual. And just at that moment, as I was telling him, we were right in front of a record store. And he turned to me and he said, well, let's go listen to it. <laughs> you remember the old time record stores where you could go in? Yeah. What you want to listen to and take it to a booth? That's what we did. We went ahead and, and uh, got the record, took it to a booth, listened to it. And that was the moment my friend became interested in spiritual things. So much so that he was very proactive and looking and seeking. Whereas I, I wasn't a seeker, even though people told me I, I was and I didn't understand. But he went ahead and found Gurdjieff and he found several other esoteric teachings and when I saw him later, he said, look, I, I want you to join me in this Gurdjieff work. It's very interesting. And he gave me Uspensky's book, which I read. And I told him, it doesn't interest me. There's too much thinking and mind connected with it. He was very disappointed. And he said, ah, I think I may have the best. I may have the exact thing for you. And I groaned because I wasn't interested. But he came back with this book called Concerning Subud. And out of respect for him, I, I took it and said, okay, I'll read it. But I didn't want to. But after I read about 20 or 30 pages, Rachman, something was coming through that book, even though I don't believe John Bennett really knew anything. I mean, was, was telling us much about Subud in that book even though the title is Concerning Subud, 
but something came through it to me. And I told my friend, I'm going to look into this. And I did. And it was Subu, New York, at the time on, I believe, on 20th Street, uh, just east of Fifth Avenue. We had a five story loft building. And there were about six or seven helpers up there. It was proscenium style. He told us about Subud and about 10 people in the audience. It was really something. And I started listening and then went in a short order and you'll understand this. I realized they couldn't tell me anything about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I thought, well, hell, I'll just sit here and go through the probation period and then try it, which is what I did. And October 18th, 1961, I told, um, oh, how can I forget him? Well, I have right at this moment that I wanted to try it. I wanted to be open. So he arranged for me to come to the Subud house on a particular night. And who should be there? I mean, I didn't know him, but who should be there? But Reynolds Osborne, who took me, um, sat me down and said, well, uh, you're going to just relax and that sort of thing. And then we went up to the third floor of the loft building, totally dark. There was one red bulb over the fire escape at the far end of this loft room, which probably was about 60 feet by 20 feet. Otherwise, it was totally pitch black. And there were about four or five other men in there. And all I could see was their shape. Later on, I recognized that one of the shapes, and you'll understand why I could recognize it, was Francis von Collar. <laughs> but the person who read the statement to me was early week. And when he mentioned God, which no one else had ever mentioned, I kind of stiffened up because I wasn't ready for that. I had no belief in God, um, et cetera. But then we, um, you know, he read the statement, said begin. And then there were noises and people moving around. I was utterly still. But then I began to sway. And, you know, I, I was very skeptical. So what was I thinking? Oh, I must be tired. So I'm, <laughs> I'm swaying a little bit. And then my feet got very, very cold. And I thought to myself, there must be a draft along the floor, that sort of thing. And then it was over. Uh, Erling said, finish. And that was it. Here's the thing, Rachman. And I was totally unaware of it. In my ordinary life, my mind went constantly, was stimulated and, and tuned into just about anything and everything going on. When we finished and I went and put my shoes on and, and filled my pockets up again in the hall outside the room and then started downstairs, Erling followed me and I said, you don't have to follow me, I'm fine. I just want to sit down. <laughs> I just want to sit down and just sit for a while. I had never wanted to do that in my life. <laughs> I was so quiet, but I didn't, I wasn't even aware of, of the fact that I was so quiet and how unusual it was until later. But I, I went downstairs, I sat in the easy chair on the first floor, which was one of the public areas. And Erling stayed with me and he looked in my face and I said, I'm fine, I'm fine. I just want to sit here. <laughs> and I did for about 30 minutes, just sitting there absolutely still. And then I got up and walked home. Uh, I was about a 20 minute walk to my apartment in Manhattan. And I was very disappointed. I thought to myself, Nothing happened. 
Absolutely nothing happened. How disappointed. I'm not one of those people who can't receive, who can't get this. I got myself ready for bed and got in the bed. And I, I thought to myself, you know what my mistake was? When that guy read the statement and then said, begin, I should have, you know, I was lying in bed now. I should have said, begin. And the moment I said that, I felt this enormous generator going off in my belly, my solar plexus, that almost lifted me off the bed. And I got so scared because it was like um, a charge just going through my whole body from here. And I said, stop, stop. And of course it did. And then I went, damn. <laughs> I wish I hadn't gotten scared and stopped it. It never happened again. But that's when I knew that something real had happened and that I better take this seriously. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So how about Lodi Hans after that? Did you feel much in the... Um, oh, I went, I went for the first five or six years while I was in New York. Um, initially, after I was open, I must have missed, oh goodness. Yeah, there, there you are. I must have missed uh, a number of Latians at the very beginning after I was opened. And I would, uh, I would realize, I would always realize that about 10 minutes after lockdown was over and I was still in my apartment, I would go, darn, I forgot again. But if I don't give up, I'm going to get, I'm going to get past this. And I didn't give up. Um, so there came a point after about three months that I began to remember it was time to do Latian. And for about six months, the only way I can describe it is this, Rachman, when I would leave my apartment, head downstairs and step out into the street, the moment I stepped out into the street to start walking to Subud House, um, all I can say is, uh, it was like I was running the gauntlet and being beaten about the shoulders in my head. And I had to just scrunch down and say, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to go. And that would be with me the whole 20 minute walk. But the moment I got in the Subud house, it would stop. And that lasted for about six months. And it hurt. Um, and also, uh, after about three or four or five months, I'm not sure exactly when, I asked if I could do Latian by myself. And I was told the upper Stetson, I was told I could. So from that point on, for about the next five years, I don't think I missed a Latian by myself. And I think that really helped me in the long term. And I remember the first time I did Latian by myself. And remember, when we did group Latian, it was totally dark except for that red light. So when it came time for me in my apartment to do the first Latian by myself, I started off in the dark. And as I stood there, I felt creepy. And I said to myself, I don't care if it's wrong or not, I'm turning out a light. <laughs> So I turned on a light. And this is the moment I said begin, I was on the floor. There was it was instant between saying begin. I mean, there was no time at all between begin and my being flat on the floor. And from that time on, uh, for some months, uh, when I did it by myself and when I did it at Subud House, I was on the floor instantly. Uh, when I said begin, whammo. <laughs> um, but I just kept doing Latian like you have. And, you know, uh, it, it gradually um, expanded. 
and my legs became strong enough eventually to stand and et cetera, et cetera. How about, uh, we had many experiences with Bapak when he came to visit. Oh, that was lovely uh, when Baba would come to visit. Um, <laughs> I can't say that I handled it very well. Um, a, a bunch of us, four or five of us, went to the apartment where he and Ibu were staying. And I remember uh, that we all went out into the hall for the elevator and Bapa came to to get in the elevator, but Ibu wasn't there and not ready. And so after about a number of minutes, Ibu came out and Bapa chided her and Ibu elbowed him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, and, and I realized, of course, they're married, you know, I mean, it's man and woman. Um, and then once uh, I was kind of the major domo, uh, so I was outside, this was some years, I think mean, 1967, uh, when Bapak was in New York again. And I came, I always came early when I was the major domo. So no matter what happened, I'd be there. And, what is a major domo? Oh, uh, that's what we called it in New York, who was in charge of seeing uh, that people didn't disturb Bapak, or if Bapak needed something, we could get it. We would be there. Uh, so I'm sitting there, uh, and then Bapak comes, and he's, he's wearing a shirt that's hanging out. He, never, he didn't tuck it in. And you know how neat Bapak always was, how great he looked. And so he stepped into the hall anyway where that was, and he, he went, <laughs> he, you know, that son, he didn't want me to see him that way after all, you know, <laughs> he was okay. Um, and then once when I was, again, the major domo, and he was going to the airplane, catch the plane, uh, he had a little satchel, and I was carrying a satchel. And then we came to a door that said, only passengers beyond this point. And like a jerk, I looked at, and I mean like a jerk. I looked at Bapak and I, and then I handed him the, the little satchel and he went. And then I realized, my God, I could have just gone and everything with Bapak instead of. So anyway, th those kind of things stayed with me, you know. Yeah. So how about. Uh... Jobs in Suwood. What type of jobs have you had? Well, um, you know, I was a, you know, when Bapak um, had our gathering at um, Skymont in 1970, he went ahead and established the, the helper um, scheme, you know. Uh, and so we all tested national and regional helpers for the different um section of the country, which um, Prio had gotten started. Um, I was one of the people tested for uh, regional helper of the East Coast at that, at that point, along with Raymond Owens. And then the women were Paula Mason and Luciana Blonde. The four of us were, the, were chosen as the regional helpers for the East Coast. Uh, and then when I went out to the West Coast, uh, uh, again, I was tested to be a regional helper. And uh, I think 1985 to 1987, I was treasurer of, of Subu, California with the Rohana Weisinger's committee. And then after that, I was a regional helper again. And then I was a national helper. 2001-2005. Any particularly strong or unusual experiences happened within those times? Oh, uh, one thing I did want to mention, we put out a little, oh, one thing I did want to mention, 
and it's kind of important. I think you'll remember this. I think it was 1964 that a group of us, including Lusana and um, Do you recall a sports writer in Subu, New York? No, don't remember. Anyway, he suggested to us, we were always looking for a way to raise money for Subu. He suggested those of us who might be interested if we wanted to learn how to make fishing flies. He was a sports enthusiast, wrote uh, for one of the New York newspapers uh, and love to fish. So he was saying, I'll teach you guys how to make fishing flies. We can sell them and that money can go to Subud. And we were all for it. Lusan and I were among those four or five who were willing to do that. So we met up there on the fifth floor of the um, loft building to learn how to make flies. We met about two or three times and then I don't know why, I'll think of his name someday. He felt it wasn't going to work. I don't know why. I don't think it had anything to do with our ability, but he decided to uh, terminate that activity. And then after that, very soon after that, Lusana and I were walking along to Subu to do Latian and We said, you know, every everyone's giving out trading stamps. You remember that, Rachman? Yeah. Stations, department stores, grocery stores. Everyone was giving out trading stamps. So we said, why don't we collect trading stamps and and let all the centers around the country know that we're going to collect trading stamps, and then we can get things for BAPAC and the secretariat, because the the uh, companies, the trading stamp companies had catalogs of enormous amount numbers of things that you could get. And if what you wanted wasn't in the catalog, they would get it for you. So that's when we started what we call the Stamp Act. Huh. You may remember that. And we notified all the centers. And it's amazing how Centers and, and individuals were, would send us loads and loads of trading stands. And we got people to Subu, New York, including Usan and me, to you know, paste them into the books. And we had hundreds of books. And we got kerosene stoves for, for Bapa. We got dictionaries for the secretariat and other things I can't even remember anymore. But it was a great, um, it was a great Subu activity. Well, they, I wanted to mention that. Well, there's one other thing I wanted to ask you about. Uh, at at a, a Congress in California, you met a certain young lady. Oh, you're very nice about that, Rachman. Thank you for answering. You know, um, I was singled. I was now getting up towards 37 years old. And I was beginning to think, when I look in the mirror at myself, I was beginning to think, Abraham, no, I was, I was Howard at that time. That was my first Zubu name. Howard, it looks like you're not going to get married. That stuff, and it made me sad. Wow. I mean, to think of myself being alone. Uh, and then within a year, you know, you're right, in 1966, uh, Subu National Congress was at the Miramar Hotel in Santa Monica, and I was the delegate from New York. And then this bunch of people, including Rockman Cantrell, came and Rosada came down from San Francisco, including a young lady named Sandra Suino. And you, you know how we met Rockman? Um, Roger Bisanya, a, a member of Subu New York who had moved recently to San Francisco. Um, we were at the Miramar and I was coming down the stairs and Roger was at the foot of the stairs 
and we knew each other and we were friends. And we said, hey, let's go have breakfast together. So we went to the, um, to whatever that Miramar Hotel Cafe was. And we walked in and right in the first booth were the Klitzners, Philip and... Um... <laughs> Lavinia. What? Lavinia. Lavinia. Uh, Klitzner were sitting there. I was facing them. Hey, because they were recently from New York too. And so we started kibitzing. I stopped there and we started kibitzing. And then this voice behind me said, there's room for you here. And I turned around and there's this great smile. And you know, Sandra could really smile. And, and she was shoving people over to make room on the bench, on the, on the booth bench for me. So I looked at her and I said, yeah, I'll sit down. <laughs> That's how we met. And after that, we were inseparable. Yeah. Yeah. And it was so nice. There was once in, um, I had arranged from uh, after the Congress, it, it's odd, Rachman, the travel agent I saw said, uh, you know, I flew from New York to LA and the travel agent says now, if you can travel to a third city and then go to New York, you can get a, a, a steeper discount on your airline ticket. I said, well, heck, let's do that. So he said, why don't I, I um, arrange for, for you uh, from LA to fly up to San Francisco. And then from there, you can fly to New York. So that worked out beautifully because that's where you and, Ros where you and Rosetta were and, and where Sandra was. So we had another few days together. And after that, we both knew. Yeah. <laughs> it was lovely. I was thankful. And did you have your honeymoon in Japan? Well, no, because uh, we weren't married when we went to Japan. Ah. <laughs> However, we weren't living together either. Uh, we played it very, very straight. Um, but we spent all our time together in Japan, the Tokyo Congress at Yamiuri Land in 1967. Uh, and then we came home together. Um, and I spent another few days in San Francisco's um, guest of the... Um, God, how can I be for Sylvia? Peter Filippelli and Rosina, and then went to New York. And, and then I wrote to Sandra and I corresponded for the next year, during which I asked her to marry me. And you know the result. <laughs> so then we got married the next year. I was 30, 39 years old. Isn't that something? Saved. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, really. Yeah. I was uh, a member of Washington, D.C. by that time. Uh, and, you know, it never occurred to me to, um, to even think how Sandra just left all her friends and her work and came to Washington, D.C. with me. And, you know, I accepted that as natural. <laughs> it was only a, a way later that I realized, gee whiz, that's, thank you, Sandra, you know. But uh, we, you know, the male patriarch system, we think it's our due. And so I didn't think of it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but then you eventually moved back to Sacramento. How did that happen? Well, um, for one thing, Washington D.C. was wonderful. We had Rowana in 1968. We married in 67. Uh, Sandra had just completed um, court reporting school. And the uh, head of the school, the Stenographic Academy of Arts, uh, liked her so much 
when he knew that she was moving to Washington, D.C., he gave her a, a letter of recommendation to the most prestigious court reporting firm in Washington, D.C., Alderson Reporting, that did all Congress and committee meetings, congressional meetings, and stuff like that. And that's where Sandra started, amazingly. And she loved it, and she was very good. So um, then we moved to California. Uh, what happened was in Washington, D.C., H&R Block was coming back to Washington, D.C. and buying up its own franchises, and they needed tax preparers. And so they announced that they were uh, going to have a tax school for free. And when I heard about that, I said, Sandra, why don't I do that? that I can learn that. So I did. And as a result, they wanted me to be a manager of one of their branch offices in Washington, D.C. Uh, and from there, uh, I thought to myself, uh, I discussed it with Sandra that, you know, maybe I, I can become an accountant, maybe even a CPA. And that's why we moved back to California so I could go to school and study uh, the requirements. And I did become a CPA. Huh. Yeah. And the nice thing was we were also in San Francisco and could visit the Cantrells on Mateo Street. Oh. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we visited you in Sacramento a few times too, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, Sacramento was... Um, we visited the Salisbury's who were living there, you know, Richard, now Theodore, and at the time he was married to Henrietta, if you remember. Uh, we were friends. We visited them. Uh, and independently, Sandra and I both felt this would be a heck of a town to raise a family. The, uh, the typical pressures of the Bay Area didn't exist there. It was a very relaxed atmosphere. And that's why we decided, let's look for a house and I'll look for a job. And the thing about court reporting is Sandra could get a job wherever she moved because they were always crying for <laughs> reporters. Yeah. So that's what happened. That's how we moved to Sacramento because we thought it would be an excellent place to raise the family. So have you over the years had any particular special kind of spiritual experiences that, that you recall? Do you know that um, the answer is yes, and yet um, I can't sort them out. Um, I, I would like to say one thing, which isn't um, doesn't it, which isn't positive. But when Bapak was visiting, I think this was in New York, and again I was there as a major domo, and I was sitting outside the room where Bapak was sitting with several people. Uh, I was sitting by the doorway to that room, and the doorway was open, so I could see everything. And I, and I looked in there and Bapak saw me looking and suddenly it's as if around my vision were flames. And I thought to myself, Bapak can tell how vain I am. <laughs> I think here I am with Bapak, you know? <laughs> and that... The flames were short yeah, how vain you are. I, I figured, yeah, they were not a good thing, you know. <laughs> but uh, I, I knew about my vanity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a, there's another thing I remember about about Bapak. Bapak was leaving. We were at the airport. Bapak was leaving. He asked us not to take photos. I had a camera. 
Do I listen to Bob? Of course not. I went outside the terminal and through a window, I could see Bopak. And as he passed, I took a picture. When I had that film developed, Rachman, Bopak was like this to me. Do you, do, you, do you understand what I mean? He was looking where I was with the camera and waving like that. And I thought it was a holy cow. He knew what I was doing. I'm serious, you know. I have that photo. I thought he didn't know anything. You know, I was sneaking and through the window taking a picture, you know. <laughs> so now that we're talking about photographs, do you have many photographs of Subud events and people? I I probably do. Um, I mean, it makes sense that I would I would, uh, but not nothing like what you have. Um, and, and I admire what you have done. I think I've told you that, Rachman. Um, you'll go down as one of the recorders, and you should. I do have, but I don't remember um, how many there are. They would all be connected with gatherings. Uh, I have a number when I, we were in Washington, D.C. I don't think I took any of us in San Francisco but you must have at the picnics and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Wonderful events, you know. Um, mostly at, gather, at Subu gatherings and at, at Subu, Washington, D.C., but none at New York. I didn't have a camera there. And I'm sorry about that because Livingston Dotson, Julia Schusterman, Virginia Bonner, uh, Francis von Collar, Reynold Osborne, they were all there. You know, I mean, to me, some of the backbone of uh, of Subu in its early stages. I would love to have some photos of them, but I, I don't think I do. Yeah. So, of all the years that you've been in Subu, what is what is the uh, the scorecard? <laughs> well. I've thought about that. Uh, number one, most paramount things is, I think I'm very slow, <laughs> you know. But the other thing is, um, I've come more and more to appreciate the opportunity to worship God more and more deeply, more and more grateful, Rahman. And um, I've come to understand really deeply and and um, firmly that our Latihan is really a partnership between God and each of us individually. Um, and by that I mean, from my experience, God shows us who we are. That's my experience. Shows us who we are and also how we can become better. That's half of the partnership. The other half is, do we do we accept what he shows us, what he what God shows us, um, and then do we do we follow what he what he's prompting us to do? That's our job. So that's what I've come to feel about about Subu, and I can't get rid of this. Don't worry about it. All right. Yeah, I think it's a partnership, very definitely a partnership. It's not God dragging us to do this and God dragging us to do that. No, I, I think God shows us, informs us, prompts us, and then the rest is up to us to follow and, and to do, because I think if we do that, we do get help from God. I, I remember as a regional and a national helper, Rachman, very, very clearly, uh, the sense of the extra power uh, I and uh, the others were given. Uh, I remember Sylvia Marvel and uh, Hamilton Manley talking about that. Uh, I think when we're given a job, when we're tested in like that, I think we're provided. And I think we're, we're provided in the Latian.
<laughs> Let's not get too serious, right? <laughs> I don't have any more questions, but if, if you have anything else you'd like to add. Yeah, I mean, think of the wonderful, wonderful people we've known in Subud. Uh, think of the, um, I mean, my own feeling about the, um, the possibilities, you know, I mean, when Bapak says, what is the aim of Subud? It's perfection of character. I mean, God, I know that how badly I need that, you know? Yes. And, and to be on the road and the path toward that, if I do my part, that's, that's a gift, you know, that's incredible. Yeah. We're very fortunate. <laughs> that we are. And we've known a lot of the great people, Rachman. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> thank you, Abraham. Oh, thank you. I, I think you're terrific. I, I just, the amount that you've done, I think, wow, there ought to be a section in the archives. Rachman <laughs> Cantrell section. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to, uh, first, first I'll ask you, do you have any objections to anyone seeing this video? No, 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 I'll leave that to you, Rachman. Okay. It's 9.15, it's past our bedtime, right? Okay. <laughs> it's past your bedtime, I don't go to bed this early. Oh, no, I know that, but uh, at my age, I, I you know, I, I don't want to go to bed early, but it comes. Yeah. Well, I'm going to end the recording. Okay. Uh, say hello to your wife and certainly say hello to your children. All right. Okay. Please. I hope they're doing well. Rahman. They are. Thank you. And, and, and I don't know if, if, um, if my travel, uh, I think my travel now is so limited. I don't know if I'll ever get up to Seattle again, you know? Yeah. So take care of yourself, buddy. You too. You better outlast me. <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs>